Hey guys, thanks for following along. Usually I'm building aircraft. This time we're building a wild pool. It sits on the top floor of a house, 24 feet deep in the water. A floor moves up and down in the pool and literally can come out of the water to turn it into a dance floor or just a couple feet deep if I got little kids in the pool. We have windows that see through into the pool. We got some crazy engineering with concrete that spans clear out over the backyard sitting on a single column. The pool actually sits over a garage. So we're gonna show you how we engineer so cars can drive under the pool. There's a lot of crazy things we got to do. Big craning, big rebar, big construction, and a ton of engineering. This is in Utah. It's gonna be able to freeze. And so I need this system to auto winterize. So I'm gonna show you some big underground water vaults that drain all the pipes every time a pump turns off, either from me or from a power outage so that this pool can be run 365 days a year. We're doing radiant floor heating, all kinds of fun things, some waterfalls, wet walls. Follow along, I hope you like this. You know, I love engineering, I hope you like this. As soon as we get this house done, we're gonna get back to building a few airplanes. I'm actually building airplanes while building the house, so I hope you follow along all of it. Catch up on the old stuff, follow the new. We love you guys, back to work. It's physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. All right guys, it's Sunday afternoon. I'm the only one working today, so I'm gonna work on something quick and easy. I'm gonna make my own skimmers for my pool. The reason for it is I'm not trying to save money. It actually could be a little bit cheaper than buying the big square skimmers that skim the leaves off the pool. But it's actually more about the fact that I've got a pool above my garage and if it leaks, it gets, comes down inside the garage and then ultimately below into the movie theater. And I just want to eliminate the risk of leaks. Now my background go way back when I started in construction, became a, a general and commercial contractor. I was doing hot tubs and pools and became one of the largest hot tub pool companies in the country. Literally thousands of hot tubs and a bunch of pools all over the West. And there was a problem that kept sneaking up on jobs, no matter how hard we tried and how good of a job we did on the install. The square doors where you skim the leaves off, because it's plastic and it's square and it's interacting with concrete, and because we live in Utah, we have a lot higher risk of deforming of that square plastic. You have the thermal expansion of concrete from the summer of 110 degrees to the winter of 10 below, and the plastic that moves at a much different thermal rate. And because it's square, you would get the plastic to move and bend away from its square shape and no longer match the concrete. And it became a huge leak area. And if you wanna see a nightmare, it's not just in climates like Utah, but it happens all over. Just get online, look on YouTube for how to fix your skimmer door leak. And you're gonna see jackhammers breaking out concrete, and sometimes just a big old blob of coking around that skimmer area. It's a huge leak problem. And I wish someone would just go ahead and make a round unit. Anytime you make something round, it's much stronger than a square, especially when you have a lot of thermal movement between two different thermal masses that expand at different rates. So I thought, you know what, there's gotta be something better. And I tried something else a long time ago. It was a giant man-made lake I did. It had a hundred foot long Roman arching bridge that went over the lake. Three giant Roman arches out of solid stone. But the whole lake I made out of rebar and gunite, and then I put skimmers around it. But I knew that the risk of a leak would be severe. And if I use traditional skimmers, this lake sat on a man-made plateau with 30 foot high retaining walls I did down one side. And I thought if this massive lake leaks and moves to that wall, the houses below, the problem we could have would be horrendous. And I didn't want wet soil under this lake. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna make something a bit different. We'll see how it works. And you know what? Sometimes simple is the easiest key. And I used square T's, schedule 80, and turned this into a skimmer. If you've built pools before, this can kind of look similar. If the water's coming in here, you would have an access plastic cap you pop off to pull out the basket for the leave debris. And then typically you wouldn't see this big of a pipe. This is three inch, you see a two inch pipe coming down the bottom. And another two inch, you could go to a bottom drain or directly to the pump system. Basically, this is a mini skimmer. And I thought, you know what? 
This Schedule 80 is almost a quarter inch thick. And if I put a rubberized seal right in here, and then the pipe comes out into the pool, we cut it off flush, and then this is the access point, and I make this a skimmer, this is not going to deform like a, a thin, flat plastic box that warps around. This will never change its shape. And so I tried it on that decades ago. It has never leaked. It is solid as can be. And every project I've ever done a skimmer like this on has been absolutely bulletproof. There is some challenges with it and downfalls. And so I don't recommend it necessarily for your pool, but it's definitely what I wanna do here is just make my own skimmers. And the reason there's downsides to it is, and I guess you could do it out of a bigger tee and make a big basket that pulls out leaves, maybe use a 10 inch tee version and, and make your own little basket or adapt a standard pool basket to catch the leaves. I actually don't want to catch the leaves in here. I have a giant underground vault sitting, the pool's right there. There's another level there that the cars will drive under. Below that is a concrete room with two giant vaults, one for the hot tub, one for the pool. That's where all my leaves and debris will catch and I'll have a giant skimming basket. And the basket will be so big, I can take an entire fall worth of giant leaves in the pool and I won't have to come out and empty a little basket on the edge of my pool. So I'm gonna use this as my skimmer and instead of having one or two, I'm using six because I wanna have them around the whole perimeter and I don't want to have, as a lot of pools tend to have, a funny, weird area where there's a little eddy current and the leaves kind of get in it and they just get stuck there and that's why you're out there with your net scraping off the top of the pool. So when I do this, I do a bunch of them and because it's only four inch, half of it's underwater, you barely notice it, but there's several. Now, I don't want anything to get in here that can clog the pipe so I've got to make a little adapter, which I'm going to do right now, which will come in from the top. And instead of having a basket right here catching the leaves, I'm going to have a little round pipe with a handle on it that I'm going to make real quick, cheap, a couple bucks, and I can drop it in here. And that handle will block anything large enough to clog pipes and turns, like if the dog's tennis ball went in. I don't want it to go down and somehow get clogged, though with this size of a pipe, it actually would go all the way to the vault. I'm gonna have a little crossbar through here. And the unit I'm putting in here is gonna be removable. And I can put a different height piece of pipe with a handle on it, that I can change the water level up and down four inches wherever I wanna fine tune the water. So I'm gonna show you how I make my own skimmer out of inexpensive, easy parts, and never have a leak at your skimmer and then have a bunch of skimmers on the pool. It may not be ideal for every pool, but on this one where I have a place to take all the water down six three inch pipes into an underground vault to catch any floating debris, and that I can't risk a leak around my skimmer door that is a real common problem, this is the only way I'm gonna go. So I'll show you how I make them. Back to work. guys I'm about done I've got my grab handle to be able to pull these out let me show you how this works you can see I've left it an eighth of an inch long I'm gonna let the glue drive glue these handles in I simply made this out of a coupler this reinforcement ring at the top to make it strong I used a router on the underside to put a radius to it and then just a piece of PVC pipe going through the middle to make a grab grab handle to pull make this easy to pull out after this glue dries on the handle that I've glued in, I'll take the sander and I'll round off and take this little edge off and make it really clean. If you look inside where the skimmer is, this can be at any different height, but I can drop this in and you can see how that's going to create a little whirlpool and set the water level at slightly above where that skimmer insert is. Whether it depends on how much water I'm flowing, how many jets, how, what speed I have my pumps on, and if I've got my waterfalls going into the pool, will change how much water is above that little skimmer. 
But like I said before, if you look inside here, you can see the little handle is blocking anything big that could come down in a pipe and plug the pipe. All the leaves, debris, maybe cotton in the air, anything on the surface is gonna go down easily through that handle down into the vault in the basement. There's one skimmer, six here. I've got a little more work sanding, clean up, and then I'll get them installed. Back to work. All right, guys. What I'm doing right now is playing in the rain. <laughs> we got a heck of a rainstorm going and a massive snowstorm coming tomorrow, so we tented the whole pool. I'm putting in the skimmer areas. This foam right here is where I'll slide this round wall we've already got made will come up and touch the edge of this foam. So I'm gonna wrap this up till it's about a half inch thick. Then I'm gonna drill a hole in the side of this and then this round wall will slide right up and touch that. This section of the beam is going, pours up under the spandex panels you can see here. And then right here, as soon as I get all this wrapped, I'm gonna carry a new U-shaped rebar that comes all the way from down here comes up to here two inches from the top of the final pour of the pool. So the pool gets poured to this green line, top of this. So the rebar's got to come up, return, come down two inches away from this wall, go down, clear into the middle, and then I got to put multiple number five bar all the way up over the top of the U-shape all the way back down. I'm going to finish getting all my drains in, all the jets, hot tub jets, floor drains, put these foam pads in, after we pour the concrete, this wall will go in the trash and I can dig out this foam and then put in a sealant between the concrete and this pipe and get a flexible joint so it's just not concrete to pipe. We have a lot more to do. Thank goodness for this because the rain is coming down and it's going to be all week. We got a little heater over there, so it's probably 40 degrees in here. It's actually really nice. Back to work. All right, guys, our bracing is done. All of this is temporary, including the wood for our overhanging pool deck. I want to talk about some of the cool parts of engineering of this single post that's holding up all of the concrete around this deck. What we've got is a design where one post, the beam's coming out to it. For example, this beam comes off the pool, lands on the post, which means this beam acts as a, a traditional beam that wants to bend in the middle right here. So it's a tensile load on the bottom and a compression load on the top, which is the opposite of the very same beam after it passes this post. Once it passes, there's nothing out here. This is hanging in midair, which means this beam resting on a post wants to bend this way. So now it's compression load on the bottom, tinsel on the top. So technically I could have changed the bar thickness and had thick bar on the bottom, light on the top, and then reversed it on the other and saved a little bit of money. But obviously it's just a little easier and you get the extra strength of keeping that bar continuous without having to do lap joints when you switch bar sizes. So we just went to the biggest bar required for either compression or tensile. We did it top and bottom, but it's kind of neat because you have this one that changes two different loads. Then you have this one that comes out and oddly enough, it's got a beam landing on it here and another beam landing on it here, just about a foot off of the main column. And there was something I did kind of thinking about if there's an earthquake, Utah is sitting on a fault line and it exists right along that mountain range right there. And every now and then we get little tremors. Matter of fact, we just had some a couple of weeks ago and back to back to back, just small ones. And so when I was thinking about this on the engineering, I thought, you know what? We can design it and have all these beams the exact same thickness and width, simplify it. But this post and deck is not the same concrete mass both directions. If you were to look at it, this fire pit doesn't sit centered on the pool quite frankly, because of the property line. So I shifted it to where I could have my property easement setbacks. Since I shifted it, there's more weight on one side than the other. And you can pick it up, even though I'm balancing everything on one post, I can design it to have extra rebar hold the 
extra mass on one side of a balanced post. However, it wasn't much work to just calculate how much more weight is on one side of a post than the other side of the post, and then slightly change the beam thickness so that when we pour, I have the same mass. It's like balancing on a teeter-totter. So now I'm not just relying on rebar to hold the strength. I've designed a balanced concrete surface. So if there is an earthquake, heaven forbid, and this is designed to handle that, but it's gonna handle a little easier if the mass is the same on both sides and I'm not shaking and then breaking and wanting to fall one way. So we went ahead and spent just a little more time and engineered a balanced mass concrete deck sitting on one post and connected to the entire round of the deep end of the pool. So it was actually a lot of fun. Not much more work, very little more cost, but hey, let's go the extra mile, it's worth it. Back to work. I'm gonna talk about how I have to build this to pour in the winter. You cannot take any risk of freezing of concrete. It would absolutely destroy the structural integrity of all this work. And so where I've got cold air underneath the deck, the sides of the deck, I have to make sure I envelope everything. So what I've done is I've wrapped the entire outside of this with a plastic and I've closed it off. I got five heaters from 75,000 to 125,000 BTUs for the day we pour. And I've got it set up so the actual heat is coming up behind this wall in a six inch gap that shielded off. And this wood will be sitting upwards of 80 degrees. And then since everything I'm standing on is suspended in midair, all of this is heated. And we built one floor that's almost five feet below me, built walls, and then built another floor that I'm standing on. And the reason I did that is I need heat to hit the sides of these beams. If you were trying to cover this up and keep heat all around it, you'd never pull it off. So I built these boxes to act as two things, the main frame to hold my structural members of the steel, but also I've got big six inch holes drilled all over underneath this box so that all the heat comes up and is trapped in each of these boxes from the closed off room below. So every side of this concrete that I'm about to pour is gonna have over 80 degree temperature. So I bought a bunch of cheap little probes from Amazon and I've got them placed throughout and I can monitor every temperature. I like a nice slow cure, so we're gonna keep it right in that 70 range. We're putting on the next six inch layer guard to go around the pool. You can kind of see how I'm doing two layers of plywood to perfect the radius, splitting the joints so I get a nice perfect circle around the pool. anchored this wall now the scariest part about doing a wall where you don't have forms where you put the straps between is you've somehow got to lock that together so the sides don't blow out and if you don't do it right the bottom of the wall is usually going to pull and then slide up on one side and drift out so these kickers if you were using just this this wall would blow out for sure so we've thrown bolts all the way down every 12 inches into this concrete floor We've also got these tie backs, these pin rods, going all the way through the wall into the garage where we've wrapped the same kind of double rebar up and then we've strapped it together. So it takes a lot more time, but when you're doing a really round wall like this and we have a lot of custom things going on with pipes everywhere, we couldn't use traditional forms. This is what's actually holding the wall from exploding. These braces were just to hold the wall in place, to hold them level while we tied everything back. We'll still leave them here as backup, but uh, today is the day we cross our fingers and hope we locked it down. We got straps on the top. You can see how we hooked the straps. Just put a piece of rebar locked it up, pulled it to the other side of the patio, anchored it to some hooks in the concrete. So we bolted the bottom, strapped the top back, and bellied the middle together with pin rods. We should be good. <laughs> but it, this wall is that big. <laughs> so there's gonna be a lot of pressure on it. 
We, uh, we have a little bit more to do. I feel pretty good. The truck should be here in about an hour and I think we're ready. So back to work. guys we have got a couple of trucks out of the way we got these big five and a half foot tall almost six feet some of them beams poured halfway up we've used the stinger vibrated them down we're gonna let that kind of just set a little bit because we we're just we don't want to blow out the bottom quite frankly the wood has gotten saturated in rain and what i would normally not be worried about at all i'm a little bit more worried so we're going to go halfway sting it out and then just work our way back come up while it's still wet, we'll come up the other half and sting it, blend the two together, but at least the bottom won't be moving so much where the wood is soft. So, so far so good, no blowouts. Nothing's even starting to move. It's, there's, we're not even seeing the beginning of any flexing. Oh, let's just get through the next five hours and four more trucks. <laughs> Back to work. <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out perfect not one wall moved even the slightest bit i did have one taped off section got hit with the pump truck but i had stuffed the inside with insulation and so the tape got knocked in a little bit i peeled it off and everything else looks great otherwise <laughs> i'd have filled a critical pipe with concrete one of six skimmers on this pool. All right, guys, we are getting closer every day. I can't tell you how excited I am to get past this part of the pool build. I can honestly say on this entire house build, the prep for these beams, so high up in the air, all temporary wood structure that all comes out, the giant steel bracing that's going underneath it all to hold the tens of thousands of pounds all throughout was just a monumental task. And it feels so good to be done. And right now I'm just doing cleanup. I've pulled off all the little trim blocks I put around it to get the beams to sit up higher. And now I can bend all these bars down, get them out of the way, then mat this all with rebar and then pour the next six inches on top. I've got to put hot pipes in it, a few more electrical lines, but this sticking up is the key way that makes it so that the rebar isn't the only thing that holds the top and the beams together in an earthquake event. The rebar is plenty. It's really about locking it. If there was a massive earthquake and this started to move, that that top wouldn't slide back and forth and cut these bars like a pair of scissors. Once it's keyed in like this, we're locked concrete to concrete as the anchor and the two can't move. 
keeps this together better. So easy, simple, cheap way to keyway concrete to concrete. It does add a little more concrete because where the keyway is, I can't count that as the structural part. I actually go above that. So it's, a, it's an inch and a half more concrete and that's it. But anyway, we have a lot to do. If you look over in the distance, these guys are kicking butt. I've been working on other projects throughout the house. These guys are pulling it apart. The wall is turned out absolutely perfect. I couldn't be happier. Um, that's the strongest pool wall I've ever done in my life, hands down. But it's also the beam to hold the spandex so that I can drive under the swimming pool and not have anything in the way. It had to be big. It is. It went great. Nothing moved at all during the pour. Sometimes you get a little movement and you got to fix it, hide it, grind it, cover it with more concrete. Nothing moved. It, it couldn't have gone better. <laughs> Back to work.